Demos is a nonpartisan public policy organization working for an America where we all have an equal say in our democracy and an equal chance in our economy. And we see these two elements as inextricably intertwined. And this conversation today about what has happened since 1976, the year in which the Supreme Court brought us this case, but also the year, frankly and fundamentally, in which our economic fortunes in, in this country started to sharply diverge. And how is it possible that these two moments in time and what they have set forth are related? Citizens United is the most well-known Supreme Court case of the 21st century, without a doubt. Uh, it's also a case that, frankly, unites citizens uh, from the Tea Party on the right to Occupy Wall Street on the left. Um, the American people know that something is deeply, deeply wrong, not only with that case and the sort of popular understanding that it stands for the fact that corporations are people, um, but also with the system that it is emblematic of, the system where, as Adam's paper so vividly uh, pushed into the national debate, 158 wealthy families have given half of the early money in the presidential primary, uh, a, a democracy in which most Americans of all ideological stripes say with confidence that the people who are elected to serve them don't care about their opinions because they care about the people that they are on the phone with as much as one out of every three minutes of every day, which is the people who can write them checks. Now, Citizens United has been a uh, galvanizing force uh, in our politics. It's sprouted an impressive amount of grassroots activity, including resolutions in 16 states and nearly 700 cities to overturn it. If you haven't seen video from a town hall in a small town where people are talking about Citizens United and the danger to our democracy, you haven't gotten around enough, I will assure you. Uh, but Citizens United is, of course, not the most important money in politics case. This case that we are here to talk about today really stands alone. It set the basic structure of campaign fin finance law for more than a generation. It first labeled unlimited political spending as a form of free speech. It introduced the basic distinction between contributions and spending, what's known as the Buckley Divide, and it gave us the basic what we believe at Demos to be flawed logic that the court extended in Citizens United. But Buckley also did something else that I think has created a chill on the democracy community at large and has put the jurisprudence very far out of step with how most people understand the problem of democracy to be at this moment, which is that it misidentified the problem of money in politics. The case said that, the, that fighting corruption or its appearance was the only reasonable justification for limiting money in politics. It declared that we the people can't limit contributions or spending for the purpose of leveling the political playing field of political voice between wealthy donors and ordinary citizens. This basic concept that we all are competing in a marketplace in our economy, but that in our democracy, there should not be a hierarchy that is related to our economic net worth, is undermined at every moment that we in the community of political actors engage in campaigns <clears throat> under this flawed premise. I have to recognize a very, very stark trend that has happened since 1976 and that may in fact not usually be part of the conversation about the interpretation of the First Amendment uh, and the practice of everyday campaigning, but it is real and it is the defining feature of our time and that is the record economic wealth and income inequality in this country. Since 1976, the year in which this case was decided, the 90% of the income distribution has had roughly about 10% in cumulative income growth over those decades. The highest paid and richest 1% has had roughly 300% in cumulative income growth over those years. 
Now, why does that matter to our democracy? Because under the framework of our current campaign finance system, people with, as my colleague Ian, uh, my colleague Adam likes to say, people with big wallets get to have big voices. And that matters to the fundamental shaping of our public policy because the rich aren't actually like everybody else. This is something that lots of us sort of know when we hang out in wealthy neighborhoods and in wealthy spaces, but it's actually something that political science research is now telling us is empirically true. That particularly on the issues about how to order the economy, the issues where in our complex economic system, the decisions that are made by regulators, the decisions that are made by state legislators, the decisions that are made by people in Congress and the White House have demonstrable impacts on the whole shape of opportunity. There is a marked difference in public opinion between those who are wealthy enough to be part of the donor class and the rest of America. And the regression analyses show that when there is that distinct difference in public policy opinion between the donor class and the rest of America, Congress sides with the donor class. If you haven't read Affluence and Inf Influence, if you haven't read Larry Bartels's uh, really phenomenal set of research on this, if you haven't read the Unheavenly Chorus, don't worry, we summarized it all. <laughs> in a report called Stack Deck, followed up by a follow-on report that is also called Stack Deck, but that looks at the impact on racial equity of a nearly all-white donor class being uh, the gatekeepers for an elected bo official body that in this country is still 90% white in a country that is almost 40% people of color. So as we think about what the direction for the court's jurisprudence should be in the generation to come, we cannot be blind to the fact that in this moment when um, Citizens United and Buckley are the law of the land, the court is very out of touch, very, very out of touch with a country that feels quite isolated from the decisions that shape their economic lives, from a country where the average family, in fact half of American families, could not meet a $400 bill that came onto their doorstep without going into debt or selling something. Is our democracy, are our elected officials really ready to answer the most pressing economic issue of our time? Stagnant wages, job insecurity, a shredded social safety net, an economic and wealth inequality of a kind we have not seen in this country in generations when these are the incentives when this is the interpretation of the Constitution that is supposed to guarantee us a form of representative democracy. At Demos, we answer that question and say no. We're going to need a new jurisprudence and we're going to need a democracy where everyone has an equal say if we're to create an economy where everyone has an equal chance. So we have an extraordinary set of people here today to talk about these sets of ideas. Um, no more extraordinary than Adam Liptak, who is in many ways the country's interpreter of the Supreme Court um, and has been for a number of years. He has a column that is closely watched in the New York Times called Sidebar on developments in the law that's been in presence since 2007. He was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in 2009 uh, on, uh, for a book called American Exception, which is about how the U.S. legal system differs from those of other developed nations. And he is uh, one of the great sort of interpreters of the law to a broad audience. And so having him here to facilitate this conversation is really a gift. And please join me in welcoming him and thanking him. Heather, thank you for that extremely generous introduction. Let me echo one point uh, Heather made. Adam Liaz has written a couple of very smart, sophisticated, uh, and in ways surprising takes on Buckley, which is the foundational decision that, um, uh, that governs our, our politics uh, today, and they're, they're really worth reading. I'm going to introduce our panelists in a second. I had thought that to honor the spirit of Buckley, we should let the richest panelists speak the most. Uh, but that got shot down. Uh, so instead we're going to have, but I'm, I'm happy to say we will have, 
uh, are quite balanced and I, I suspect um, in places heated discussion about where Buckley, uh, where Buckley leaves us. Uh, I'm gonna give you insultingly short introductions of these very accomplished panelists because I don't wanna spend time on them. The bios are in the materials. Uh, but starting on, on my right and going to my left, we have Joel Gora, uh, who's a law professor at Brooklyn Law, who uh, litigated Buckley, and who, used, who worked for the old ACLU, which still believed in free speech. Um, following her, uh, Cleta Mitchell, uh, uh, an election law lawyer at Foley and Lardner, uh, Dan Takaji, an election law specialist at Ohio State, which is stocked with election law specialists, and then finally, we'll hear from uh, Brenda Wright, who's vice president at Demos for policy and legal strategies. Now, I've been told uh, that each of these people who has, well, let, let's start by, I, I thought I would print out the Buckley decision to prepare, <laughs> but it was 186 <laughs> pages long. Uh, uh, and I'm gonna give them each five minutes to give us some thoughts <laughs> on, on Buckley. And I'm told I have to be rigorous, and I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll see how much backbone I have in keeping you to five minutes, but let's start with Joel. Uh, thank you, Adam Liptak, for that uh, wonderful introduction, and thank you, Adam Leos and Demos, for organizing this event and for including me in it. Um, uh, I am uh, here uh, uh, not to bury Buckley, but to praise it. Uh, I think Buckley was a landmark of political freedom. I think it embodied the view that free speech is not the enemy of democracy. Free speech is the engine of democracy. The enemy of democracy is government control of free speech. And the statute that was challenged by the ACLU and others in the Buckley case was an embodiment of incumbent government control of free speech. A Congress full of incumbent passed this, incumbents passed a statute making it extremely difficult, if not impossible, for anybody to challenge them by severely limiting the amount of money that ch uh, candidates, challengers primarily, could spend to try to challenge those incumbents by limiting the amount of money that people could spend even of their own funds to challenge and uh, uh, to attack uh, challengers, to limit the amount of money that could be given to candidates by people who supported them and agreed with their position, uh, and even to limit the amount of money that independent groups and individuals could spend speaking about <coughs> candidates. And what that meant in real terms was, uh, if you ran a one quarter page ad in Adams newspaper, the New York Times, criticizing the President of the United States during an election year and spent more than $1,000 for that ad, you had just committed a federal felony. No more free speech, a federal felony. And to those of us at the ACLU, the notion that the government could punish people for spending more than $1,000 to criticize the President of the United States was indeed the most frontal assault on the First Amendment since the Alien and Sedition Laws. And that's what we said in our brief. And fortunately, on the main principles of the case, the Supreme Court agreed with us. The case had a number of other little vicious incumbent devices in it. Um, uh, broad and burdensome disclosure of everybody who gave as little as $100 to a candidate so that there'd be a ready-made enemies list for all the incumbents to see who dared support people that were trying to challenge them. Not to mention all the cause organizations in the United States who had a special section in the law targeting them for regulation and disclosure of their members and supporters. Um, and this law, heralded as reform, um, was going to be enforced by a commission hand-picked by the leaders of the House and Senate. Um, the ACLU uh, 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 and the other challenges in the Buckley case saw that not as reform, but as the government control of political speech uh, and anathema to the First Amendment. Fortunately, for the most part, the court agreed uh, and, and uh, on two essential principles. Government cannot limit how much political speech there is, and government cannot level, level the quality and quantity of political speech. For the political speech, we need as much of it as we can get and not as much of it as the government thinks it is proper for each of us to have. Uh, and I think that principle, as I said at the outset, uh, is a, uh, the basis for democracy, not the antithesis of democracy. There was one major flaw in that landmark case. Uh, the court uh, struck down s expenditure spending limits but upheld contribution limits. Whatever the reason, compromise, split the difference, whatever. Um, that has caused, the fact that we have contribution limits has caused so many of the problems that everybody's concerned about for the last 40 years. 
Uh, because if you can only give $1,000 to a candidate, but you really want to help that candidate, you believe in that candidate's ideas, you might look for other ways to express those views. Uh, PACs, remember PACs? They were the bad, evil uh, uh, village uh, uh, monsters of, of 30 years ago. People gave money to PACs because they could contribute 5000 to a candidate, not just one. And then after that, we had a generation of soft money, money given to political parties, money given to... Uh, labor unions, money given to cause organizations to speak about government and politics, not subject to control by the FECA. People put their money there. Uh, and then McCain-Feingold came along to try to shut that down. And McCain-Feingold was challenged by uh, an unlikely coalition of the, the, um, the United States Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO, not to mention the ACLU and almost every cause organization in America, because they saw that as another effort by government to control the speech of its critics. Um, unfortunately, the Supreme Court upheld that in the McConnell case, but happily um, uh, in Citizens United righted that wrong and said that any person or any group can spend as much as they want to criticize the President of the United States. Now, why that principle should be viewed as a threat to democracy is totally beyond me. Now, let me talk a little bit about super PACs. Um, I claim that I represented the first super PAC in America. It was not a, really a PAC, and it wasn't very super. Uh, it was three guys who, in 1972, thought that Richard Nixon, the President of the United States, was a war criminal because of his conduct of the war in Vietnam. And they got together some money. It was you know, $20,000, $30,000, pretty good piece of change back then. And they ran a two-page ad in the New York Times attacking the president, calling him a war criminal, and praising a half a dozen members of Congress, very liberal members of Congress, who had introduced an impeachment resolution. Um, for their trouble, they were the first sued under the Federal Election Campaign Act. The government's claim was... The law controlled anybody that spent any money in media advertising that would have an effect on the election, that would support or oppose a candidate, President Nixon, for re-election. Uh, that brought that ad within the confines of the Federal Election Campaign Act. It required the, uh, the super PAC to report its members, its contributors, and worst of all, to get the permission of everybody benefited by that ad to run that ad because the law included limits on media expenditures by candidates, and the New York Times would commit a crime if it ran that ad without getting the approval of George McGovern that the ad would not cause him to exceed his media expenditure level. And if you can't see a worse invasion of the First Amendment than to say you can't run an ad like that in the New York Times or the Times will go to jail unless George McGovern approves it, that was my first exposure to campaign finance reform and the ACLU's first exposure. And, uh, and the, the principle of those three guys and the principle of the big guys today, the big, people with the big wallets today, is the same principle. Uh, to, to paraphrase the, uh, the uh, closing uh, line of, a, of an old joke, we're just haggling about the price. If you can spend $20,000 to support a candidate, you can spend $200,000 to support a candidate. The First Amendment should protect both equally because what's, what you're buying is speech and communication and information for the public. And maybe I agree with that speech. I don't have 20,000, I don't have 20 bucks. But if somebody that has more than I do can speak in a way that supports my point of view, that amplifies my voice. And so we viewed uh, uh, um, uh, all of these restrictions on the funding of political speech as restrictions on political speech. Um, and, and fundamentally violative of the First Amendment, and worse, or equally bad, bad for democracy. Now, I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm going to conclude by being a law professor. Um, um, about 100 years ago, the great liberal justices of the day, free speech justices, Holmes and Brandeis, began the project of trying to get us to the point where we said, if there's anything the First Amendment means, it means the government cannot control political speech. And they wrote their great dissents of the day because the government was putting socialists in jail for advocating things, communists in jails for advocating things, etc. Finally, in a case like Buckley, we sort of have a, a, a consolidation of the project begun 100 years ago to say government hands off political speech. Holmes and Brandeis started it. The seven to one majority of the justices in Buckley who struck down the expenditure limitations continued it. 
the five brave justices and citizens united who said that applies to groups of individuals as well as individuals have carried it further, and I think they're on the right side of history. So Joel has said a lot of provocative things, but I think we can all agree on one proposition. It shouldn't be a crime to advertise in the New York Times. <laughs> uh, Cleta, do you, do you think we need more campaign finance regulation or less? Well, I think that with the First Amendment is, uh, I agree with what George Will says when he calls the five, the first five words of the First Amendment the most beautiful words in the English language. Congress shall make no law. <laughs> so I will answer it that way. And I actually think here we are in the First Amendment lounge talking about Buckley. I would posit that the description of this uh, Buckley is, is not one with which I would agree. I don't think this was the most important decision on money and politics. It was a most important decision on the First Amendment rights of the American people to engage in a public dis discussion of public policies and issues. And so to, to me, what Buckley represents, and I love reading this case because it is brilliantly written in terms of the description and the language about what the First Amendment means in the context of, of political speech and expression. And I'm going to read some of it to you because I've had discussions with some of my law partners and others who very angrily denounce Citizens United only to finally get them to admit they've never read the decision. So the first thing I would ask is before you criticize it, I hope that you've actually read Buckley. The first general principle articulated in Buckley was this. The act's contribution and expenditure limitations operate in an area of the most fundamental First Amendment activities. Discussion of public issues and debate on the qualifications of candidates are integral to the operation of the system of government established by our Constitution. The First Amendment affords the broadest protection to such political expression in order to assure the unfettered interchange of ideas for the bringing about of political and social changes desired by the people. As the court has observed, it can hardly be doubted that the constitutional guarantee of the First Amendment has its fullest and most urgent application precisely to the conduct of campaigns for political office. Now, I am not sure why that's objectionable. But to some it is, and thus began this 40-year hand-wringing about how the court could possibly have come to such a preposterous conclusion as to write such things as this. A restriction on the amount of money a person or group can spend on political communication during a campaign necessarily reduces the quantity of expression by restricting the number of issues discussed the depth of their exploration, and the size of the audience reached. Now, one of the things to me that is most interesting about Buckley is that, to my way of thinking, two of the most significant passages are found in footnotes. In fact, I would argue that the two most significant parts of the decision are found in footnotes. The first one having to do with this notion of spending limits and what the court concluded after much discussion following more about what I just read, but in a footnote said the following, being free to engage in unlimited political expression subject to a ceiling on expenditures is like being free to drive an automobile as far and as often as one desires on a single tank of gas. Now, the court went on to talk about the fact that Every means of communicating ideas in today's mass society requires the expenditure of money. The distribution of the humblest handbill or leaflet entails printing, paper, and circulation costs. Speeches and rallies generally necessitate hiring a hall, publicizing the event. The electorate's increasing dependence on television, radio, and other mass media for news and information has made these expensive modes of communication indispensable instruments of effective political speech. So when the court was considering these provisions of the law, they were actually thinking in terms of, as a practical matter, 
if you are going to ha recognize a First Amendment protection for, free, for political speech and activity, you can't possibly believe that expenditure limits are compatible with that First Amendment principle. And so the court eliminated the spending limits. As Joel has pointed out, the court did uphold, and that's another interesting thing about Buckley, the court upheld most of the law, the framework of the law that Ellen uh, oversees every day and that I try to advise my clients on uh, compliance with is basically the framework that the, that the Supreme Court upheld in Buckley. But for 40 years, the people who lost part, the part that they lost have been whining about the parts they lost. And I don't see my guys, we need to whine more. We need to be better whiners because the court did upheld the contribution limits. The court said, and, and you know, there has been Justice Berger, Justice Thomas have written that contribution and expenditure <coughs> limits are the flip sides of the same coin and would, and would invalidate the contribution limits. And yet, they did, not, they did not invalidate the contribution limits. What the court did do, and this was the other important footnote in the case, is that the laws... Uh, the, the court worked overtime to uphold the law and not strike down certain provisions that set certain re uh, government regulation of political speech relative to a clearly identified candidate. That's what the statute says, relative to a clearly identified candidate. And the court spent some degree of time talking about what does that mean? relative to a clearly identified candidate. Quote, the distinction between discussion of issues and candidates and advocacy of election or defeat of candidates may often dissolve in practical application. Candidates, especially incumbents, are intimately tied to public issues involving legislative proposals and governmental actions. Not only do candidates campaign on the basis of their positions on various public issues, but campaigns themselves generate issues of public interest. And it goes on to talk about how different hearers will hear different things when uh, someone is speaking. Some may see that as a, as a call to uh, candidate activity. Others may see it as a solicitation for some other kind of action. And the court said that the First Amendment does not allow a situation which causes a speaker to, as the court described it, to hedge and trim to worry about, if I say this, will that subject me to government regulation? And the court went on to say that and, in... And maybe this will be the last, I mean, it's a long... This is it. Okay. I'm not going to read all that. <laughs> that, the, uh, that but I am going to read the footnote. Because what the court went on to say was that it was necessary in order to uphold the law and not strike it down entirely on vagueness grounds to set some parameters and that the First Amendment requires a bright line. So a speaker will know in advance whether the speech in which he or she is, or it is about to engage is subject to government regulation or not. Because the speech, if it is going to be subject to government regulation, needs to, by its express terms, be candidate-related. And the court, in the footnote, said this construction... This construction, meaning it has to have some specific candidate-related call to action, would restrict the application of the statute, the statute that says relative to a clearly identified candidate, to communications containing express words of advocacy of election or defeat, such as vote for, elect, support, cast your ballot for, Smith for Congress, vote against, defeat, reject. Now the court has been, this case has been pilloried because of the magic words test. But what the court was saying is in order for this to su survive First Amendment scrutiny, then the law has to be more specific and people have to know what is subject to regulation and what is not. That is the First Amendment principle. And I will, I will close by saying this. What, is, what has now happened finally after in the last two years, really, all since Citizens United, is that for many, many years since Buckley, there was this notion of, 
you know, well, it was wrong, we need to fix this, and it's because of money, and blah, blah, blah. And finally, and, and those of us on my side of the equation who actually do believe in the First Amendment and its protection of free political speech and that the court got it exactly right when saying that, that the First Amendment has its highest application within the context of political speech. And what has finally happened is now that there are people talking about, okay, well, we just need to fix that First Amendment. We just need to change it so that it no longer is deemed by the court to have its highest application and basically to say it doesn't have any application to political speech. I would argue that James Madison would turn over in his grave and that the very people who would have us amend the First Amendment to withdraw this protection that the court articulated so well in Buckley are the same people who would tell you, but of course, the, the First Amendment protects the right of an artist to put a crucifix in urine. I think the fact of the matter is, the First Amendment protects speech that none of us like, and the First Amendment protects all of our speech and our ability to associate and to engage in criticism and advocacy, and that is what the First Amendment was intended to be and to do, and Buckley, the court in Buckley has written beautiful paragraphs about that principle. Thank you very much for that vigorous presentation. As we move to my left, fittingly, uh, I think we might get some different perspectives. Dan, did you agree with everything you've just heard? I agreed with one thing. <laughs> is that enough? It's, uh, it's a delight to be on this panel and to engage in vigorous debate. Um, so like Joel, I was an ACLU lawyer before I became a law professor and litigated a lot of free speech cases in that capacity. I suppose if he is representative of the old ACLU, that makes me representative of the new ACLU, which believes in free speech, not just for the very wealthy, but for everyone. Free speech, make no mistake, is on both sides of this issue. Now, over the past six years, we've seen a torrent of criticism directed at the Citizens United decision. I think that criticism is not so much wrong as it is misdirected. The real target ought to be Buckley versus Vallejo, which has been an unmitigated catastrophe, not only for our election law, but for our democracy. It has led to the slow motion train wreck that has been the story of campaign finance regulation as well as the story of increasing influence on the part of the super wealthy in our democracy over the last two score years. Buckley opened the door, or at least seemed to leave the door open to campaign finance reform while making effective regulation impossible. No one should like Buckley. No one should like Buckley, except for those super wealthy who are able to exercise disproportionate influence on our politics as a result of it, and the political consultants who make their living off of it. The only real question of, of any significant difficulty is which way Buckley should fall. So no, I don't agree. Um, before talking about that, however, I, I, I'm going to focus in the remainder of my remarks on the two big things Buckley got wrong, but I do want to mention the one thing that it got right. Buckley was right to say that political donations and spending are entitled to some First Amendment protection. Money may not literally be speech, but it enables speech. And indeed, this is the very premise of campaign finance reform. Because it means that if you don't have a lot of money in your bank account, if you don't have a thick wallet, to paraphrase Adam, 
you don't have effective speech in our democracy. What Buckley got wrong were two big things. First, it took equality off the table as a value that can ever justify restrictions on political spending. Equality has become the Voldemort of our campaign finance law. Right? It is the word that must not be named lest any regulation be struck down. That includes not only restrictions on contributions and expenditures, but even public financing schemes as in the Arizona Free Enterprise case a few years ago where the mere invocation of leveling the playing field was enough to get that law struck down. Now, equality since Buckley has, in a couple of cases, most notably Austin and McConnell, sort of snuck in through the back door, disguised as an anti-corruption rationale. This is where I, I may depart from some of my friends who support campaign finance reform. I, I actually think that if we're being honest, those cases weren't consistent with the spirit, if not the letter, of Buckley. And that Citizens United actually follows logically from Buckley's premise that equality is an impermissible basis upon which to limit political spending. The other big problem with Buckley is its bifurcation of contributions and spending. And this is actually a point on which I think there may be some agreement. Um, contributions to candidates as well as parties can be restricted. Outside spending cannot. That not only creates this constant pressure on candidates to raise more and more and more money. I mean, if you talk to any decent public official candidly, they'll complain about this. It's also created the post-Citizens United situation we have where less and less money relatively speaking, is going through candidates and parties. More and more of it is going through super PACs and other outside groups. My co-author Renata Strauss and I detailed what this looks like. We talked to a lot of people across the political spectrum. What was interesting when we talked to them was that there was actually widespread agreement on what's happening, right? That less of the money is going through candidates and especially parties, right? The parties, at least the party leadership, are becoming weaker and weaker relative to these outside groups. Um, there's also not complete agreement, but general agreement, and I think you heard some of it here, that this is a bad thing, right? Um, it's a bad thing that these relatively unaccountable outside groups, and you know what they do best is run attack ads. This is partly responsible for this circular firing squad we see among the Republican establishment candidates in the current election. This is not how any sane person would devise a campaign finance system. Again, Buckley versus Vallejo is responsible. The difference among those that we talk to is it, who do they blame, right? You know, I've stated my position, and I, I think the Supreme Court is primarily responsible. If you talk to Republicans, and, and there is some truth to this, um, they'll say, no, it's FICA and BICRA. You heard some of this from Joel a few moments ago. And I do think that there actually is a serious argument here. Given the bad constitutional law that Buckley gave us, where you can't limit spending in order to promote equality, this money is going to come into the system one way or another. And there's a strong argument to be made that given that bad constitutional law, it would be better for the money to be coming through the candidates and parties than through these shadowy outside groups. It's sort of a pick your poison situation, but again, it's ultimately attributable to Buckley's line between contributions and expenditure. And as long as Buckley 
remains our constitutional law, meaningful campaign finance reform will be impossible. So it sounds like we might have an agreement in, in one sense. Everyone agrees the line is in the wrong place. But yeah. there may be disagreement about what, which, where, which way, way to move the line. Fall. Yeah. Right. Uh, Brenda, what do you think? What, 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 what's next for efforts to uh, address Buckley? Well, um, I guess, first of all, I should say how uh, delighted I am to be part of this panel. Um, I've been detecting that there's a, there's a lack of passion in the room here, so I, I'm going to have to do something to try to make up for that. Um, I've been thinking of what to do, but um, I'd like to make a, f a few related points uh, before tackling that question of, of what's next. Um, one of the themes that's really striking for me in uh, hearing the discussion so far is uh, the emphasis on uh, the freedom that is protected by the Buckley decision, the freedom of speech and the First Amendment values that that embodies. And we certainly heard that loud and, and clear from uh, Joel and Cleta, and, and that First Amendment freedom is a very important thing, as Dan has acknowledged. Um, I think that one of the most important things to think about, though, um, in understanding what that freedom really means is to, is to just realize for a moment that the freedom to spend unlimited amounts of money on elections is a freedom that is available to almost nobody in this country except a tiny, tiny handful of people. It's a freedom in the abstract that simply is not real. And one of the best illustrations I've seen of this, it's a cartoon that I love to throw up on the PowerPoint slide when I'm giving a talk on these things. It shows a couple of guys who look like they're Supreme Court justices in robes, and they've gotten out of a limousine. And they're sort of bending over and talking to a homeless family under a bridge. And the caption of the cartoon says, we just want to assure you that you are now free to spend as much as you want in electing your candidates of choice to office. And I think it just sort of perfectly captures the fact that waving the freedom flag is, is an appealing thing. But if it's a freedom that can be exercised by only such a tiny handful of people, what does it really mean? Sheldon Adelson was free to spend $92 million on super PAC funding in the 2012 presidential election. So that means he must really, really care about the issues, right, to spend that much money? Well, actually, it turns out that that 92 or 93 million was 0.37% of his total net worth, and it would take 322,000 people giving a similar percentage of their net worth to equal the $92 million that one person was able to spend in that election. <laughs> So what does freedom mean in that context? Uh, President Obama and Mitt Romney in 2012, they raised something like $313 million from all of their small donors combined. That's, that was 3.7 million people. Well, that's, that's pretty good, right? It took just 32 super PAC donors to equal that spending, giving an average of $9 million each. 32 people versus 3.7 million people. And, and as Heather already referred to, there was the story just last week about 158 families in the US providing half the money in the presidential election so far. So I really think it's important to add to the equation here the fact that the, the freedom that is supposedly being protected by the Buckley decision and this, the Supreme Court decisions that have been generated by that decision is, is a freedom that's simply unavailable to the vast majority of us. And, and that's a problem. And, and one of the solutions that I heard Joel mention to that concern is that, well, as long as somebody else is spending money, has that money to spend, and it may reflect the views of the people who don't have the money to spend, it's all good because the views that we all want to hear about will get out there anyway. Well, the problem with that is that that's simply not reality. And as the research that Heather was citing has really decisively shown um, the views of the wealthiest of us who make up the donor class are very different from the views of the vast majority of Americans, especially on some of the most important issues around the economy, economic fairness, minimum wage. Um, 
all of the issues that affect Americans in their pocketbooks and in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so the idea that we're somehow going to get all of the views out there if just a tiny handful of people can enjoy that freedom is simply wrong empirically. Um, I, I, I want to sort of shift focus in following up on that to um, talk about uh, something that we discovered when I was working for the National Voting Rights Institute several years ago, uh, which was that the city of Albuquerque, New Mexico, actually turned out to have had spending limits on its books from 1974 through, I think, 1995. Spending limits were in effect for mayoral elections in Albuquerque and city council elections in Albuquerque because the word about Buckley hadn't gotten to Albuquerque. <laughs> It's like they've been kind of preserved in a little dome of you know, purity or silence or whatever. They just hadn't gotten the word. Nobody had sued over it. And it gave us, it, I remember talking to a reporter about this when uh, we first found out about it, um, that I felt like a scientist who had been studying an extinct species of butterfly <laughs> all their professional life and suddenly found one flying around in her own backyard. Um, and so the reason I'm bringing it up is that I think it's a, the, the experience that Albuquerque had under actual spending limits refutes a lot of the fears uh, and concerns that have been raised about what do spending limits result in. Um, you know, one of the biggest issues, and, and Joel uh, referred to it uh, uh, right up front, is will spending limits uh, be an incumbent protection measure? Will it prevent challengers from having the resources that they need to take on an entrenched uh, incumbent? Well, the city of Albuquerque, during the time the spending limits were in effect, every time an incumbent mayor was challenged, the challenger won, every single time. And if you looked at the city council elections, uh, the rate of uh, challenger success there was higher than in city councils throughout the rest of the United States. There was no problem with turnout. Turnout, if anything, uh, in Albuquerque was higher than in comparable cities during this time period. Uh, incumbents uh, were not able to outraise their challengers, which is one of the biggest problems that challengers face when they want to take on an entrenched incumbent. And so the world did not end in Albuquerque. We did not have a police state in which government censorship took over people's lives. It worked. And um, I think that it's, it's a really important thing to keep in mind that uh, a lot obviously depends on how a particular regulatory system is constructed. And I would acknowledge that FICA was not perfect. And I think we can do a lot better. But the idea that um, striking down all possible regulation of the amount of money in politics in the name of the First mm -hmm. Amendment, in the name of freedom, uh, is something that we have to live with uh, forever in, uh, in, in our democracy, um, I think we should reject. And I also would just want to maybe end by reminding folks that uh, the criticisms of Buckley you know, were there from the beginning. Um, it's, it's been in place for 40 years now. But it has been subject to quite a deal of mm -hmm. criticism and dissent over time. And for example, no one remembers this anymore. Uh, but even Justice Kennedy, in a 2000 decision, uh, Nixon versus Shrink Missouri government, uh, wrote in uh, a dissent that, you know, I'm not sure about this distinction that Buckley made between contributions and spending. And I might be open to considering a system in which both spending and contributions are limited in order, in order to ensure that candidates' time can be protected from the demands of fundraising and can instead uh, be focused on governing. That was Justice Kennedy in 2000. Now, you know, later on in Randall versus Sorrell, <laughs> which I know well because I argued it, he kind of said, he kind of did an Emily Littell and said, never mind. <laughs> and so he didn't come out with that. Uh, uh, he, didn't, he didn't fall that way on Buckley uh, when he had the opportunity. Um, but I bring it up just because, um, you know, I want to put a point on the fact that Supreme Court opinions um, and Supreme Court and even opinions of individual judges do change over time. And one of the efforts that uh, Demos is engaged in, uh, along with uh, partners like Brennan Center, Campaign Legal Center, is really developing a new set of jurisprudential tools so that when and if a new set of 
justices on the court is ready to take another look at the issues raised in Buckley. They'll have the, the tools that they need to do that. So I think we may shortly have a special guest, but in the meantime, uh, I'm going to probe a little bit of some of the things we've heard. And let, let me start with you, Brenda. Um, I, I take it it's a given that political speech is at the core of what the First Amendment protects. Is that controversial? No. Okay, good. Um, and, and you say that expenditure limits can, can work just fine, and yet there were people in the courtroom at Citizens United who were quite worried about the idea that a documentary about a political candidate, uh, could the distribution of that could be made a crime. And that uh, a deputy United States Solicitor General said the same idea might well extend to books. Is that, is that really the world we want to live in? I think that the world that we want to live in, as, as we would envision it, uh, is different from that. I think that um, the kind of system that we're looking at and uh, beginning to uh, develop more fully is one in which you would look at um, a sort of aggregate limit on what individuals can spend and contribute um, in terms of uh, elections and um, peg that to what uh, average citizens can afford, but put no limits at all on, you know, once an individual makes those donations, uh, and it would be accompanied by uh, vouchers as well, no limits at all on what the political entities that want to spend money in that way uh, can do. And so um, I don't see that there is any necessity for the kinds of problems that you are canvassing uh, if we set up a system in the right way. Okay. Um, Dan, where, where do media corporations fit into this? You know, the, we, we heard that very few people have the ability to spend a lot of money to influence elections, but Fox News does, the New York Times does. What's to be done with us? And I think th that is the hardest problem for those who advocate campaign finance reform. Um, it, you know, my difference between those on your other side is that it's the kind of problem that, at least in the first instance, I would leave to Congress and other legislative bodies to try to figure out. And indeed, Congress did that in the Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act in McCain-Feingold. There was a media exception that was written into the law, even though strangely a lot of Justice Kennedy's opinion in Citizens United has to do with why you couldn't do this to media. Um, I think in, in you know, just in the, whatever it is, 14 years since Bikra was written, the media has changed a lot, right? And if we were writing the law today, which of course we can't do because of Buckley and Citizens United, but if, if we were writing the law today, we'd have to come up with a better definition, one more suited to the current time period than uh, the one that exists in or existed in Bikra before Citizens United. Again, my difference is that at least in the first instance, I think that legislative bodies like Congress, state legislators, and local city councils should be allowed to give it a try. I, I don't say, by the way, and I, I hope this was clear from my initial remarks, but, but I want to make sure that there's no doubt. I don't think that courts should rubber stamp every campaign finance regulation that any legislative body issues. Look, there are a complex mix of values. There are strong values on both sides here. Liberty, competition, equality, preventing corruption, transparency, the list goes on. A good model is actually what the Canadian Supreme Court does, where in, in short, marked contrast to our Supreme Court, they've actually <clears throat> accepted equality as a legitimate democratic value. Imagine that, right? And, and they don't actually uphold every law that comes before it. Rather, they ga engage in a careful weighing of these values and careful consideration of the evidence. Sometimes they strike things down. Sometimes they uphold them. The difference is that their approach, in contrast to the approach that our 
Supreme Court has taken allows all these important democratic values, small d democratic values, to be taken into consideration. Joel, what's, what's wrong with equality? Justice Stevens, when he talks about Citizens United, says, well, we give each side 30 minutes to argue their case. On this panel, not very well. I've tried to give you all equal time. What's so bad about that? Well, equality is a wonderful thing, but not when the consequence is limiting free speech. Um, I think that's, uh, that's the problem from the beginning, because uh, the, the, the problem with the, using equality to limit free speech is, where do you draw the line? I mean, the problem of, of limits on free speech is uh, to, uh, to achieve equality, and I think it's a, it's a, uh, a fool's errand, because I think it's going to be impossible to try to do that, and yet in the process we're going to be undermining, destroying the First Amendment. So where should we begin? Uh, we limit the candidates in order to uh, make sure that they're equal in their speech about the elections, but the incumbents are way ahead of the challengers, so the equality is gone right away. Um, we limit uh, what independent people can spend to try to uh, uh, control equality, but then we lose all of the ability from citizens and their organizations to criticize the government uh, if they can't spend more than $1,000 a year to uh, bring about equality. Um, uh, what about the issue organizations that want to um, discuss issues that the candidates are involved in, the ACLU and all the other groups? Um, the law tried to limit them. The law struck down in Citizens United did limit them. Um, uh, if equality is a justification for that, then we've silenced all those groups and the people they represent in the interest of equality. And of course, your employer is one of the greatest uh, contributors to speech inequality because your bosses have a whole lot more speech than I do because they have a whole lot more money than I do. Um, and so I think uh, you can't dance around that issue. Um, and some election law scholars for whom I have the highest regard are willing to say, yes, if we're going to be serious about equality, the press has to be included in that package, and we have to have some control uh, so that people uh, who own the press will not have too great a voice. Um, and by the way, why stop there? Let, let, uh, let me stop you for a second, because I think we're going to move from the pure good of election law theory to the real world of elections uh, and, uh, and hear from uh, Senator Merkley of Oregon, who will tell us a little bit about how this plays out in the real world. OK, so much for equality of speech. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, I'm delighted to hear about equality of speech uh, because I'm going to be addressing that some. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me to come and, and join you all. Uh, Adrian Sneed on my team is here, and I just thought he'd, I'd have him uh, raise his hand. Uh, please follow up with him. These are issues I'm going to be deeply engaged in throughout the time that I serve in office. And thank you for Demos uh, for inviting me to speak with you all today. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here to examine and revisit Buckley versus Vallejo. Here we are, it's January 30th, 40 years. It is a decision that has forever altered the role of money in politics in our country. Before I dive directly into the case, I wanted to go back to the summer of 1787 when a group of patriots, farmers, and scholars gathered in Philadelphia. They signed their names to that document, that beautiful document we know as the Constitution that has guided our nation's progress for over two centuries. And they started that document with these three simple words on parchment, we the people. And with that, they launched what has been called America's second revolution. With those words, the founders described what our government was all about and what it was not about. It was not to be a government to serve the ruling elites. It was not to be a government to serve the titans of industry and commerce. It was not to be a government to serve the best off, the richest in our society. Quite the contrary. The genius of America was a government designed, as President Lincoln so eloquently summarized, of the people, by the people, and for the people. Central to this promise was the right to participate as a citizen of the country on an equal footing in the conversations related to elections and issues. Every citizen would have the right to stand up in this town square and contribute opinions and insights on elections and issues of the day. President Jefferson called this philosophy the mother principle. 
He summarized it as follows, quote, governments are Republican in proportion, only in proportion, as they embody the will of the people and execute it. And then he followed it up by saying, for let it be agreed that government is Republican in proportion as every member composing it has an equal voice in the direction of its concerns by representatives chosen by himself and responsible to him. President Lincoln echoed Jefferson's equal voice principle. He said, and I quote, allow all that governed an equal voice in the government, and that and that only is self-government. My argument before you today is that Buckley versus Vallejo is a direct assault on the notion expressed by Jefferson and by Lincoln, a direct assault on the principle embodied in our Constitution. Forty years ago, the U.S. Supreme Court took a bulldozer to the we the people pillar on which our government is founded. In finding that individuals could spend unlimited sums to influence issues and to influence the outcome of elections, the decision destroyed the notion that all citizens would be able to participate in our nation's governance on a roughly equal footing, or as Jefferson and Lincoln put it, with an equal voice. Buckley versus Vallejo is the opposite of government of, by, and for the people. By greenlighting the spending of unlimited sums in combination with the high cost of participating in the modern town square, that is, through time secured on radio and television and the web, Buckley versus Vallejo has given the wealthy and well-connected control of the town commons. The decision hands the wealthy and well-connected a stadium sound system they can use to drown out the voice of the people. It has driven a stake through the heart of Jefferson's mother principle that, quote, governments are Republican only in proportion as they embody the will of their people and execute it. The result is that most of the time, the outcome of a debate or election is favorable to those with greatest incomes or greatest wealth. Certainly, a situation where the 10% at the top can drown out the 90% or the 1% at the top can drown out the 99% is not a we the people democracy. It's the opposite. You're not government by and for the people, the government by and for the powerful. The Buckley decision allowed unlimited independent expenditures was based on a naive understanding of American politics. As Justice White pointed out, the court accepted that when wealthy supporters bankroll a campaign with huge donations, it creates at the very least an appearance of corruption. And that's a serious enough problem to warrant limits. But it creates real corruption. If corruption is the debasing of the foundation of government of, by, and for the people, then it creates real corruption, not just the appearance of corruption. Considering what has happened, the court was disastrously wrong. The most basic premise is that through influence over elections, you have influence over governance. That's the whole point. Influence over elections is not limited just to being in the, the booth and pulling a, a lever. When you enhance the voice of the wealthy relative to everyone else, you fundamentally shift the outcome of legislative deliberations. The wealthy do not have the same concerns about the cost of college. They do not have the same concerns about paid family leave or the solvency and adequacy of Social Security or the affordability of health care or the retention of good paying manufacturing jobs here in America. The wealthy do not have the same views as the rest of America on capital gains taxes, on progressive income taxes, on tax credits and deductions for special interests, and of course they do not have the same view on campaign finance. As a result, a small subset of our population has been able to systematically turn the gears of government to serve its own narrow economic interests, to influence elections, to influence policy via elections and the threat of future in participation in elections, and also to structurally consolidate their power and enhance it in an endless loop that takes away from our We the People government. So let me ask you, is it any wonder that the middle class is doing poorly during a time period in which the wealth of our nation has increased dramatically? Isn't that what you would expect? when a small group of wealthy control the policies of this country on 
by and for themselves. Let's think about this. 1945 through 1975, we have what I like to refer to as three golden decades. The status of middle-income Americas increased dramatically. The size of the middle class increased dramatically. Workers participated fully in the wealth that they helped to create. During that period, the bottom 90% received approximately 70% of all income growth. Now compare that to the next four decades, 1975 through 2015. Four decades of middle class decline. What a difference. During the three golden decades, workers fully shared in the prosperity they helped to create. And in the four decades since, they have not shared in that prosperity and said they have received close to 0% of income growth. 70% income growth, 0% income growth. And standing at the pivot between the three golden decades and the four decades of middle class decline stands Buckley versus Vallejo. Well, one can cite many factors in this shift. One can cite the oil price shocks of the 1970s. One can cite the surge in cheap imports that displaced manufacturing jobs in the United States of America. But we must not overlook this key structural change in the character of our country. It is no coincidence that a change in which we strengthen dramatically the influence and power of the most wealthy has led to an era in which the most wealthy benefit from the growth in the economy and workers do not. The Buckley effect is a playing field tilted steeply in favor of the few most affluent in our nation. And it bears on every issue I work on in the U.S. Senate. Whether it's tax fairness for the middle class, or affordable housing and health care, or clean air and clean water for our children, or ending predatory mortgage loans, or trade policy that strengthens rather than weakens the leverage of American workers. The court decided Buckley as a question of First Amendment jurisprudence, but in the process, deeply damaged the very essence of our democracy. Are we, can we be a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, if some individuals and groups have vastly greater influence over elections and policy than others? Our Constitution says no. Our founders said no. Buckley versus Vallejo said yes. With a campaign finance system that gives the richest Americans massive influence with concomitant control over legislative outcomes, we don't have a government that embodies President Jefferson's mother principle, that is one that reflects and executes the will of the people. It doesn't reflect the principle or summary that the President Lincoln put forward of, of, by, and for the people. Let's change this. Let's recapture the genius of American governance. Let's restore the we, the people principle so eloquently embedded in the framing of our Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to say the Senator may have time for just a couple questions. Uh, so if you have one, raise your hand. Uh, I believe we have a mic and keep it short. Hi, this would be a question for the senator or, or uh, maybe one of the uh, constitutional litigators. Um, I wonder if, uh, since we are focusing on uh, political equality at the end of the day um, and the role uh, of, uh, of this decision, if there isn't some way to square the circle, it looks as though you know, you, you've got a, a very solid First Amendment jurisprudence that's pretty um, uh, uh, right exactly it, it, when, it, when it comes to political speech. <laughs> but I wonder, we, it, it, there is another uh, uh, sort of a challenging First Amendment principle. And it's, it doesn't come from outside of the jurisprudence, it's within it. If we believe in one person, one vote, in the uh, holding of Baker v. Carr, uh, 14 years older, is there some way, without having to go into the murky material world of uh, you know, a class equality, let's say, which may not be, it may be harder to measure, at the end of the day, is there a way to square the circle by taking the holding in Baker v. Carr, one person, one vote, and seeing if that standard is met by uh, a federal uh, campaign uh, finance 
uh, laws and regulations, looking at it through that lens. Is that perhaps an answer to, uh, to a way to square the circle here on, uh, uh, on Buckley? Well, I'll, I'll speak to it not as a lawyer, because I'm not a lawyer, and not as a constitutional scholar, certainly. Uh, and, but I will say this, that the principle of one person, one vote was a mechanism to reflect this deeper principle of governance in which people had a roughly equal voice. And so it is not simply a, a piece, it is not the end of the journey, it is a reflection of one strategy that was used by the framers <coughs> of the Constitution to capture the underlying belief that you had to have a fairly equal voice. Let me give you an example. Envision the original town comments. And let's say that the city government said, we need to raise some money. So we are going to rent this out to a company, and that company can charge for who gets to stand up and speak in our city debates. And then those who had money in the town rented it, and nobody else got to stand up and share their views. That is the, essentially the transition that we've had in America, and it's completely contrary to the founding principles. And you, we can have constitutional scholars weigh in uh, and talk about the, the First Amendment and say unlimited volume is okay even if it drowns out everyone else. But that was not the viewpoint of our founders and that was not the framing of our Constitution. Uh, so I get to say that as a non-scholar. Non <laughs> anyone else? Yes, sir. Here it comes. Thanks very much. Uh, I'm curious, in the midst of uh, the Citizens United jurisprudence that we're dealing with, there have been a couple flashes of light. One of them, uh, both of these are from the judicial election context. But one of them has to do with Caperton v. Massey, a 2009 decision that said, if somebody spends millions of dollars to put a judge on the bench, that judge should not be able to hear a case affecting that person. And the second is from last year, williams Uli versus the Florida Bar, that said that the state has an interest <coughs> in prohibiting a judicial candidate to go around and ask with their hat in hand for money because it impugns public confidence uh, in the judiciary. So do folks here think that, that those flashes of lights uh, give hope in other context uh, in electoral law? Thanks. Well, I do have an opinion on this, but I don't want to... No, 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 no please. Yeah. <laughs> you have the floor. You have the yeah. mic. <laughs> what the decision last year reflected to me was we have Supreme Court justices who are very familiar with what it means to be a judge. <laughs> what it means to have integrity in the judicial branch of government, and that they're much more sensitive to that than they are to an understanding of what it means to have integrity in the legislative branch of, of government. They readily saw that there was both the potential for corruption uh, and the appearance of corruption if a person directly solicited donations and therefore said it was OK if, if that was banned by the state. But they were so quick to see that this was unacceptable in order to have a, a judiciary valued and appreciated as a, as a judgment maker in our society. And, but we're unable, and, and I don't believe a single member of the court has either run for office or been elected to office. So they have never seen it through the legislative lens that it's also important that the citizens of the United States believe that there is integrity in the legislative branch. And integrity means that people have roughly an equal footing to be able to participate so that the government is in fact serving the body as a whole, not predominantly a single section. And so the, if, if they would come to my town halls, uh, we might not have had Citizens United. They could have heard in the conservative town, I do a town hall in every county every year, 36 counties. Most of my counties are conservative and then I have some very progressive counties in, in Oregon. Uh, the, but in both, there's deep cynicism about what's happened in our nation. People feel like our system has been bought, and they're not far from the mark. But I wish the, the judges had a more real-life experience on the legislative side. Maybe it would have changed the 5-4 decision on Citizens United, which doubled down on Buckley versus Vallejo in terms of the uh, corporations. Please join me in thanking the senator. Now, we're not going away just yet, um, and I, 
I know I've asked questions of everyone except Cleta. I have a question for Cleta too, but I want to follow up on that last question. Can I just finish the answer to my uh, your question of me before the senator spoke? Of course. Um, we're talking about the equality principle and how far it should go if the goal is to try to get everybody having the same amount of political equality. Uh, and we, I spoke about limiting candidates, et cetera, et cetera, and the press. And the final area, and I don't want to give any of you some, uh, any ideas, um, what about lobbying? Uh, big corporations, big unions, big special interests spend a ton of money every year on lobbying. Now, there's some regulation, some disclosure, some uh, sort of conflict of interest rules and things like that. But many corporations spend 10 and 20 times as much money each year on lobbying as they do on anything else, as certainly as they do on political work, uh, election work. And so if you're talking about equality and access to the political process, shouldn't you extend that principle to lobbying work? Now, to be sure, the right to petition is also protected by the First Amendment. But Dan says, First Amendment but Dan says it we, it's a complex world. We have to take a bunch of things into account. These lobbyists have much more influence than I do. They're up there right now, probably buttonholing people like the senator. Uh, I can't afford to do that. Um, maybe some of the groups I contribute to can, but who knows? So if we want to have political equality for all of our citizens, look how broad that blanket has to be. And, and my feeling is we shouldn't even take the first step down that road. Let, let me explore the interest the court has acknowledged, which is corruption or the appearance of corruption. As the questioner suggested in the Caperton decision, uh, which featured exactly the opposite lineup of Citizens United except uh, Justice Kennedy flipped, Justice Kennedy wrote that judges should recuse themselves from cases in which someone has spent a lot of outside money to help them get elected because they might feel a debt of gratitude toward the donor, to the spender. Uh, and it's a little surprising he, he thinks that judges are more corruptible than politicians. <laughs> but why, should, why wouldn't a politician feel a debt of gratitude to Sheldon Adelson? Well, let me ask. Oh, it was Cleet, I apologize. Let me talk about Sheldon apologize. Adelson. Apologize. Because Sheldon Adelson spent, what did you say, $92 million in 2012? 92, 93. His candidate lost, let's not right. forget. There's a Latin let's phrase let's... for what he got for his money. It's called <laughs> bupkis. <laughs> and, and the fact of the matter is, he has a right to do that. I don't know why that bothers people. It's his after-tax money. If he wants to poop it off on candidate that doesn't win, what difference does that make to us? Now, you ask a question. I have to tell you that I disagree with the court's decision in Caperton because I don't think that the government should start policing whether elected or appointed officials feel gratitude because you get into... if. How, how is that discerned? And I want to come back to the language of Buckley <laughs> because I think it matters to read and hear what the court said on this subject. Because tell me why you think this is wrong. The First Amendment denies government the power to determine that spending to promote one's political views is wasteful excessive or unwise. Government can't do that. In the free society ordained by our Constitution, it is not the government but the people, individually as citizens and candidates and collectively as associations of political committees and corporations under Citizens United who must retain control over the quantity and range of debate on public issues in a political campaign. I, I ought to tell you, I'm always very bothered by this subject of equality in the public square. Or you know, I, I'll tell, if, I'll tell right. you something. I, I actually ran for office and served eight years in a state legislature. And you know what the first thing you have to do when you're going to run for office is? You've got to figure out how you're going to support yourself during the time when you can't get a paycheck. Now, let me tell you something. If you're a rich person, instead of somebody just out of law school with student loans to repay, that's not as big a deal to a rich person. But the first, so a rich person, rich people have more. They have more of everything. They have bigger houses, better shoes, you know, more country club memberships, they have more of everything. But I want to walk through, I'm, I'm just fascinated by the senator's comments. He says, 
that between 1976 and others, I guess Demos takes this, but between 1976, and Buckley has you know, created this income inequality in our country and all these terrible things have happened since Buckley. One of the things we haven't talked about that the Buckley court did was that it upheld the presidential public financing system. And from 1976 until the 2000 campaign, every candidate who ran and was elected, and some who were in prison and still got the government money, literally, um, year after year, right, Ellen? We tried to stop. Yeah, yeah, but you couldn't, but <laughs> because the statute, they met the rules. They didn't say you couldn't be in jail and get the money. And so we had six presidential elections where it was all government money, which is the altar at which most campaign finance reformers worship. Let's get all the private money out. Let's be serious. Let's have only the government money. We had six presidential elections where there was only government money. And we didn't have all that outside spending. We didn't have super PACs or any of that. Three Democrats, three Republicans. And are you guys going to sit here and tell me that uh, under Bill Clinton, because of Bill Clinton and Jimmy Carter, who were elected under this public financing system, that all these horrible things happened to our economy? Let's go forward to 2000. George W. Bush was worried about Steve Forbes running against him in the primary. So he didn't, he, he so I'm going to forego the matching funds in the primary, but he took the general election money. Fast forward to 2008. Who is the first candidate who says, I'm not taking any government money? I'm taking 100%. Private money, 100%. Barack Obama. I haven't heard a lot of hewing and crying about that and whining about that. But let me just tell you the numbers. So Barack Obama raised, during the 2008 cycle, about $800 million. Well, let's say he spent half of that in the primary defeating Hillary. I don't know how much it was, actually. Ellen may know. But so let's say he spent half of it. $400 million. Let's say he spent most of it against Hillary. $300 million in the general election. So he had general election money. And his, op his opponent, John McCain, took the government money. You know how much money John McCain spent against Barack Obama in 2008 because he took the taxpayer financing? You want to want to guess? $79 million. $79 million versus three, four, five hundred million. And Barack Obama had money left over. So the point is, all of these... And now are you going to tell me that in these last eight years the economy has, has tanked and people, all these horribles that the senator talked about because of the money? I mean, it's insanity. I, I'll stick with these articulation of principle of the First Amendment in Buckley, which is why I enjoy reading that case. I'm going to give Dan a brief rejoinder, then we're going to have questions. So I, I actually really appreciate Joel and Cleta's comments because I think they actually frame the issue quite well. Rich people, she says, have more of everything than the rest of us, so why shouldn't rich people also have more political influence than the rest of us by virtue of their wealth? Well, I don't know. One person, one vote. You know, we had Harper, a case uh, half a century ago regarding poll taxes, which stands for the basic principle that wealth isn't <coughs> germane to political parts participation. And there is a fundamental philosophical difference between those of us who believe in political equality regardless of our wealth and those who don't think that that should be a democratic value that legislative bodies ought even be able to consider. On the lobbying point, I, yeah, I, I, I think there are problems of political inequality associated with our lobbying system, and I would open the door to a greater extent than our Supreme Court has to regulation of lobbying on equality ground. And finally, on the judge's point, the question that Scott asked, um, so is there hope give for, for a, a change of heart given Caperton and williams Uly? I, I actually think no, as long as the current court sits. Justice Kennedy and Caperton, Chief Justice Roberts in williams Uly, they see judicial elections as fundamentally different. They worry about bias based on contributions and spending in the context of judicial elections, the worry that that might conceivably be in the back of judges' minds. In the context of legislative elections, they think it's perfectly OK, or at least not something that Congress can regulate for people who have spent or given large amounts of money to have greater access and influence. That is just not a problem 
that Congress or any other legislative body is entitled to deal with. So let's turn to questions. Yes, sir, in the blue sweater. And maybe a microphone will come to you. And again, questions rather than comments, if you would. Yes. I'll try to keep my brief. I want to ask about an area of law that actually the pre-Buckley framework still exists for, and that's foreigners. Foreigners Foreign. can contribute nothing, Foreign. and they can spend nothing. Foreigners. Foreigners. Foreign, yeah. foreign nationals or right. corporations. Right. Lacking permanent resident status, you're prohibited from giving yeah. money in the United States. In so it, assuming if you'll give me that either foreigners have a First Amendment right to speak right. or I have a First Amendment right as an American citizen to hear them speak, right. did the court get it wrong in Blumen by upholding the restrictions on foreign spending? And if not, how do you reconcile that with Citizen United and Buckley? Excellent question. Joel, you seem to. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yes, I think the court got it wrong in refusing to hear it. The Blumen case was a case involving, I, I, I may be a little bit off about the facts, but basically two uh, people here in America uh, on valid visas, students or work visas or things like that, here for a considerable period of time, but not uh, lawful permanent resident aliens. Uh, and therefore, under our laws, it was a crime for them to make even a uh, a $25 donation to a federal candidate, or to spend even $25 to print up some leaflets saying this person is good, vote for them. Um, no contributions and no independent expenditures. And the argument was, we're not talking about the government of China taking over America, although it seems to have done so effectively on the economic front. Uh, we're not talking about secret uh, foreign slush funds taking over. We're talking about two people validly here for a period of time who want to speak about government and politics. And shouldn't the principle of Citizens United that you have to be very careful when you bar people from speaking about government politics should apply to that case? I think it should have. I think the lower courts um, simply sort of blindly followed the notion, well, Citizens United said it's not about foreign contributions or things like that, and so it doesn't protect this. But it seems to me, uh, in, in a country which prides itself on free speech for everybody, rich, poor, and everybody in between, to deny people who are here among us the right to print up and hand out a leaflet uh, uh, saying uh, President Obama is great, re-elect him, is, is wrong. I have a lot of First Amendment trouble with it. Again, you want to distinguish it from slush funds, foreign uh, secret uh, contributions, foreign governments, and maybe it's not that easy. But in that one case, I could, I could make a distinction. Yeah, so if Alexis de Tocqueville rose from the dead and wanted to give uh, his <laughs> views about whom to elect for president, is that really something we should bar the American public from hearing? Well, I, th I think that the issue about um, the participation of foreign nationals in our elections is a much bigger problem for the people on that side of the stage mm -hmm. and the consistency of their views than it is right. for the folks. No, I mean, you, you got, I, I take it you guys Here. think that the logic of Citizens United extends to speech by foreign I was, I was actually surprised that they didn't want to take it mm -hmm. any further because the whole premise of Citizens United is, oh, it doesn't matter the source of the funds. That doesn't matter at all. It's only that the funds would be out there and it would increase the amount of information that the American people have, it does, so the source is irrelevant. And that would be equally true for you know, the government of China as it would be for an individual if you really, really believe in that principle that the only thing that matters is the more speech that you get from whatever source, the better. Now, and I think, you know, the other side of the equation is, I mean, I think that's sort of the, the, difficult, uh, the difficult place for the, the First Amendment absolutists to try to deal with. I think that the, the question of the media and how you treat the media under uh, uh, a system where political equality is a guiding value is tough for our side. Um, but I think those are, those are equally tough. <laughs> uh, and, and they both require line drawing. Um, and that's inevitable in any system that makes sense. Well, and I, I am not somebody, first of all, the Citizens United Court did not, it's, remember that famous scene in the State of the Union mm -hmm. message where the president is standing there talking about how this opens the door to foreign uh, contributions, which of course it doesn't, and Justice Alito is saying that's not true because it specifically the court said leaves intact the other uh, provisions of the statute this only dealt with the, the provisions related to corporations and labor unions. Um, so, and I actually don't have a problem with that. I don't have a problem with the bar on federal contractors. 
giving uh, money. I don't have, I do think that there is, that there, I, I am, I'm for drawing very narrow lines, but I, and I think that that's a narrow line that can be drawn. But I do have a problem with the idea that the, because here's the deal, people, I, I do this, I ask people in audiences, and I say, okay, how many people think there's too much money in politics? Well, everybody raises their hand. Okay, how much is there? Well, then people, no, no, you say there's too much, well, how much is there? And then here's a question, how much should there be? And then here's the most important question, who gets to decide? Who gets to decide and what is included? By golly, I want to include the New York Times in that equation. You're here. <laughs> I want to say, if we're going to talk about political speech, we're going to talk about the corporate soft money that the New York Times spends advocating its views. We're going to talk about the corporate soft money that the Washington Post uh, uses to advocate its views. You can't start drawing those lines without getting into serious, serious First Amendment problems. Well, that's the soft money that I assume Demos Where do I get some of the soft business. money? You get it every day <laughs> in your paycheck. That's where it comes from. That's soft money. Well, then I'm all for it. Uh, yes. So I just want to go back to your comment about the senator's comments, mm -hmm. um, stating that you can't see the connection between the influx of money and the state of our economy. Um, and I just want to know, how would you square the fact that majorities of Americans want things like minimum wage increases, <coughs> um, tax cuts for the bottom 70 percent, et cetera, how do you square those empirical research studies of what the policies that people want with the actual policies that are being debated and passed by state and the federal legislature? Well, if, it's, if it's not money that's corrupting or influencing that decision making. You know, I realize it's hard for some people to believe, but there are also studies, and in my experience over f nearly 50 years in, the, in politics and policy and law and lawmaking, the fact of the matter is everybody I know who runs for office runs for office because they have a certain set of beliefs that they would like to advance once they get there. And over time, um, maybe they get, quote, corrupted. But in my experience, the people, I had an event for a candidate for Congress who's running against my incumbent congresswoman uh, at my house a week ago. And the fact of the matter is, this is a guy who's running for office because he believes in certain things. And the people who come to see him decide whether or not they agree with what he says. And if they do like what he says, they're willing to give him 100 bucks or whatever. And the fact is, to me, that's the way it's supposed to work. I don't think people make decisions once they get in office because they're getting campaign contributions. For the most part, I don't see that. But here's the other thing. You guys keep talking about the donor class. OK, I'm working on this one. Now, is this the donor class that is the Hollywood donor class? Or is this the, Holly is this the donor class? Oh, so, so the Hollywood donor class. You would say that these are the same, they have the same views as the donor class who shows up at the Coke meetings. Would you say that they have, they share, they, they, they have the same views because they're the donor class. So they must all, because they make a lot of money, they're really rich, they all agree. Is that what I, that's what I keep hearing. Or is this, is the donor class that goes to Democracy Alliance meetings to give buckets of money to left-wing groups and causes, are they the same donor class and they agree with the Coke donor class? I mean, some of these assumptions are just wrong. They're just wrong. Well, if, so if I could elaborate, I mean, there is an answer to that. Okay, the, good. The, the survey research uh, that we're talking about uh, looks at the wealthiest uh, individuals as a whole. And yes, of course, there, there are some differences within that group. It's not 100%. <laughs> But if you look at uh, policy preferences on issues like, should we have a minimum wage that is high enough for a family that the person is working full time, their family would not be in poverty, you have vast majorities of all Americans agreeing with that. And you do not have a majority of the people surveyed in the donor class agreeing with that. So it's not who's monolithic, the, who, who but it's class? very different. Overall, <laughs> policy the, preferences in the aggregate. Who is the donor class? It are depends. you surveying donors? Are you surveying 
people and then dividing it by... Some of the studies are looking specifically at donors. Some of them are looking specifically at people of a certain income level. Well, there so you there's, go. there's a lot of diversity in the research, but the direction well, that it points it. in is very, very clear. But one reason why policy preferences aren't enacted has to do with gerrymandering too, doesn't it? Lots sure. of reasons. I, yeah, Lots I, of I, reasons. I, don't, I, I don't think All anyone would back. say that money in politics is the only sole problem in our democracy. Going to the news right now, a lot of people are not happy with all the candidates running amongst the uh, Democrats and the Republicans. And we heard that Michael Bloomberg is considering a run. But by the time he decides whether he can run, it appears that only someone of his wealth could actually run as a candidate, as an independent. So I'd like the panel to comment whether we think it's a bad idea, <clears throat> the Constitution should be interpreted to ban someone like Michael Bloomberg for running for office because he would spend too much money on his campaign. Well, obviously, I, th I don't think that Michael Bloomberg should be banned from running for office. You know, I, I don't agree with him, and he's got a, I don't agree with what his position on most issues, but the Constitution ought not to interfere with his right to do that. Now, I also believe, just as in 1992, at that time, Ross Perot could run and support his own candidacy and spend as much as he wanted. But he couldn't give money to an organization that would support, say, a Colin Powell to be able to run. And Colin Powell, of course, couldn't, he wasn't as wealthy as Ross Perot. Why would it be, why is it okay to spend your own money but not to be able to give it to an, uh, another organization? I refuse to call these outside groups, by the way. Outside of what, for God's sake? But I believe that people have the right, and the court has interpreted this properly, People have the right to spend their money as they deem appropriate, whether it is to buy Tostitos at, for the Super Bowl or to give to candidates or to run for office. Or to own a newspaper. I, I or to would, own a newspaper. I would second that, uh, and I think that's why those of us that feel that Buckley got it two-thirds right and one-third wrong would, would like to fix that one-third and eliminate contribution limits so that a Bloomberg or a Perot or somebody could run for president or support somebody else running for president who shared their ideas, fully disclosed. Let us decide That's if right. there's too much corruption or undue influence or if we want to elect a candidate that just got a big fat check from Michael Bloomberg. Dan, where do you stand on limits on self-financing? So um, I, I, I certainly don't think Michael Bloomberg or anybody else should be prevented from running for office, but I don't think he should have a constitutional right to spend an unlimited amount of money getting himself elected to office. But that problem, right, the, the wealthy candidate, it, it's really just the tip of the iceberg here, right? There are a relatively small number of people in our, our democracy who are and entities that are spending an extraordinary large amount of money to influence elections, and not just that, to influence the policy that gets made after election day. I, I mean, does anyone in this room seriously believe that all of these people are stupid? Right? That they're just wasting their money? Of course not. I've they're getting that. something in exchange for this stupid. problem. And if you believe in the idea of equality, that is a problem, albeit one that our current Supreme Court prohibits Congress or any legislative body from addressing. So yeah, I think that Congress and other legislative bodies should have the power to take these multiple democratic values into consideration and draw appropriate legislation that reconciles. See, I think where this all leads is to um, the idea of a sort of a S ration. You know, the soldiers in the war had K rations, food. S ration, a speech ration. Uh, every citizen will get a certain portion of speech, maybe a government voucher provided, um, and then they can use it to um, uh, set up a think tank on issues, to support candidates, to lobby, whatever they have. But in order to advance equality, nobody can spend more than their speech portion. Uh, I don't want to live in a country like that. Well, actually, could I, could I speak to that? Because um, it, it's interesting. Uh, the, looking at the potential for a voucher system, for example, in which, uh, as a public financing measure, everybody in the United States would get $100, $150, to 
provide to the candidate of their choice, a PAC, uh, any kind of political committee, whatever they want to do with it. Um, By the way, I think that that's a would, great idea. That would, yeah, yeah. And, you know, that could actually, that sort of speaks to the question of, you know, the reform community just wants to get money out of politics, limit the amount of money in politics. Well, how much is too much? Actually, uh, some of these proposals, depending on how they're structured, would great, could greatly increase the amount of money that we have to spend on elections. But what it would do is democratize the source of that money. Right. And, if you and if you combine that... I think we can cut a with, deal right now. And if you combine that with spending limits uh, that uh, prevent the wealthiest uh -oh. people from, oh, we going almost had it beyond, <laughs> from going beyond the level that any ordinary human being can think of spending in elections, then you've got the start of something that could actually bring much more speech into the mix if you accept the premise that all speech has a one, that all money has a one to one relationship with speech which you know clearly empirically is not true so but we're, if that's we're, your really, premise, we're really almost out of yeah. time but i feel like in the spirit of free speech we'll take one more really good question <laughs> yes ma'am Thanks for giving me the last word. Um, so I really appreciated uh, the senator's comments and bringing it back to the kind of basis definition of democracy of one man, one vote. Um, and I find it kind of ironic um, that you know this side of the stage tended to repeat the idea the of that's not the we're type of America I would like to live in. Um, and back to the idea of equality, the type of America that you live in currently is not the type of America that the majority of Americans live in. Um, and when we look at history, you know, a lot of, you know, trying to make sure that people have equal say has had to be, you know, the government has had to step in multiple times. Um, and, you know, the, the 40 years of Buckley, 40 years ago, we just started to allow all of Americans to have a say in this political arena. So um, I, I just would question and I would want to hear your response as to, the idea that money does not buy influence, that money does not buy power, that a, a millionaire and business owner and person who has millions and millions of dollars to give and to put out propaganda, to put out billboards, and to skew the scales does have the same say as someone who can't even get into the room to speak. Well, I will tell you, as a practitioner, at one point in my career, I said I wanted to uh, specialize in wealthy self-financed candidates. Um, and I have represented a number of wealthy self-financed candidates, a number of them. And I think they all lost. I think they all lost. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And we're going to see what happens on Monday night in Iowa, whether this wealthy self-financed candidate who has made his name because other entities paid him a lot of money to be, uh, become a household <laughs> name. Um, we're going to see how that plays out. But all I can tell you is I want to live in a country who has equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity. Not a, not a country where the government mandates some sort of false narrative of equality of outcome. I don't want to live in that land. I want to live in a country where I can, as a just out of law school, young 25-year-old woman with no money and trying to figure out how to pay my grocery bill, my mortgage, and my student loan payments, ran for the legislature and beat an incumbent. That's the kind of country I want to live in. And I raised and spent money according to the limits and I knocked every door, and I did all of the things that I believe that are important in our democracy. Now, let me tell you, do I think that there are some political and election-related changes we could make? You bet I do. We could triple the, the size of the House of Representatives and cut those districts by two-thirds. You think that would give more opportunity? There's nothing in the Constitution that limits the number of members of the House of Representatives. We could say, like a number of states do, that it's illegal to raise money, but for members of Congress to raise money during the congressional session. Man, that would get these people out of town. <laughs> so there are lots of things we can do, but don't start with the premise, because it's a false premise and it is a terrible situation for the future of our country 
to say we're going to guarantee, the Congress is going to write a law, and we're going to guarantee we call it equality of outcome. I don't want to live in that country. So we, we can go on and on, uh, but I want to congratulate Demos for uh, honoring the First Amendment's values of bringing together such a diverse uh, array of points of view. I think it's been a really productive and interesting discussion, uh, and please join me in thanking the panel. Thanks to you. Thank you.